Yo, 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 what's good? I know there's been a disgusting amount of people that's been sleeping on Scion, but today we're about to put that to an end. Many of the people from the fandom have been introduced to her character through Grand Order, but do not let what's going on in the Lost Belts give you the wrong impression. Scion will put you in the dirt, my guy. No exaggeration needed. Now, there's a few things that have to be addressed before we get started. Originally, Scion is from the Melty Blood timeline, and then over time she made her way into FGO. But here's the thing, we don't know what she is or isn't capable of in Grand Order. All we know for certain is that instead of being half dead apostle like she was before, she is labeled as a bloodsucker instead. Another thing that you have to put into perspective is that she's lived two completely different lives between these timelines. This means that some of the original talents that she had before may have been traded off for something else since they weren't really required. Prime example, her not having to go rogue for three years. But for the sake of this video, we're gonna go ahead and base this around her original form. So when it comes to Scion, she is from the Atlas branch of the Mages Association. She's an alchemist. And as such, she puts a great amount of energy into formulating her plans. She's smart, extremely smart. In fact, she's probably three or four steps ahead of any interaction that she makes. The first thing that we're gonna be taking a look at is her speed and her strength. Scion is known to be half vampire or half dead apostle if you remember their appearance back in Fate Zero. When it comes to speed and strength, she excels at both aspects on superhuman levels. Numerous amount of times she's shown us, unless you're quicker than the average mage, come on man, you might as well not even waste your time. We've seen her dodge two forms of projectiles, both chains and wind waves from point blank range by Tatari Arcaway. We've seen her escape back-to-back -back wind waves in the forest against the real Arcaway. We've even seen her keep up with Wallachia, who we know for certain to be extremely fast, one of the fastest people in Melty Blood, if not the fastest. In a matter of seconds of her first time meeting up with Shiki Tono, she had already scanned his brain and accessed a great bulk of information that could be used to her advantage. But enough of that, let's get into her endurance. Thanks to her vampiric background, she can also sustain a lot more damage than she would normally. She's taking on full-blown hits from Arcawade and Wallachia, She's fallen several stories from the top of a building into a block of stone with little to no damage at all. She's taken on a slash to the chest from Shiki only to recover just moments later. He gave her a full body of slashes. She recovered from that. You have situations like the one against Wallachia where she miraculously was able to survive some of his strongest spells, Night on Blood Lair, and Night Ruler head first with no problem. And if that wasn't enough, she can heal herself too. Next we have skills and abilities. Because Scion comes from a family that was born lacking in magic circuits, her strength in magecraft is geared mostly toward her skill in advanced technology. If she has just a 0.5% chance of gaining the advantage, she will take that chance just to ensure that she gives you the business. She is not a fan of taking shortcuts and she does not like to go against strong enemies unprepared. The one time Shiki was fighting against Tatari Yuzu, Sion was in the back analyzing every clash that they made to get a better understanding of their movements. Her ability Thought Acceleration gives her brain more room to find out quicker openings against her opponent. Her ability Memory Partition allows her to separate her own mind into seven compartments, making it easier for her to respond since her mental load has been lightened drastically. Then you have her mystic code, Etherlight. This is the advanced technology of the Eldnums that really shows what their magecraft is truly made of. By putting this code into a target of her choosing, she can hack into a person's brain to simulate their usual thought patterns to calculate the proper response. 
This comes to her easier than you might think, considering that the ether light is virtually invisible to the naked eye. This code has several manipulations, including strengthening her healing process. By pressing this against her own nerves, she can heal even faster than she could before. You have the time when she was fighting alongside Shiki, where she used it to disable the limitations that were being set by his own nerves. This in turn gave him access to a practical berserker form in exchange for a huge crash after their battle. She can also use this on herself. She can layer the strings of her ether light multiple times, allowing her to create a boundary field and trap the person inside. Is that not enough? How about using her vampire background and her ether light in tandem to create shadow clones? Then, in some aspects, these clones function just like the original form. At this point, it's not even fair. Last but not least, we have her black barrel replica. This is a replica of the mystic code, the black barrel, one of the seven taboos that's located inside of Atlas. These seven taboos originally being weapons that could bring destruction to the entire world. Just to give you an idea, normally these weapons are locked away, but Scion, however, has managed to get her hands on the blueprints for the code and create her own version, reimagining its power. Adaptability. Because her family's name has been desecrated throughout the years due to her ancestor Wallachia's motives, Scion grew up being looked down upon for a long time. She is the type to work twice as hard as the average person just so she can prove herself to the world. After becoming a dead apostle due to Wallachia, she defected from the Atlas Academy and went rogue against two of the biggest branches in the Nasuverse for three years straight, Atlas and the Holy Church. To this day, they still haven't been able to catch her. So if we're talking about adapting, before you even get to the fights, her ability to adapt is through the roof. She went as far as breaking the rules of Atlas by going to other academies trying to create a vampire cure. What this also tells us about her character is that she is not straight lace. She definitely has her own set of morals, but if she has to get dirty, she will. In fact, one of the first times that she met up with Shiki, she tried to kick his head off his shoulders mid conversation. Another thing that you have to mention is that since she was never caught by the two branches, this implies that it's very rare that she gets sloppy with her work. Other scenarios you might include would be her fight against CL, where she got hit on purpose as a distraction before disabling the limits on Shiki's nerves. She was able to keep up with the real Arkaway, who is a true ancestor. She strategically lured Arkaway into a forest in order to slow her down, she created a boundary field out of her ether light solely as a distraction to trap Ark away with the ones that she had planted on the ground. Even Ark was giving her compliments on having her get serious and use one of her spells in order to protect herself. In regards to the sheer force of her Black Barrel's power, it is massive. The gun is so strong that she literally has to tie herself to the ground with her ether light in order to do one of her special shots. We even saw a variant where she had Shiki hold her down instead. To spice up his assistance, she actively combined her Black Barrel shot with Shiki's Mystic Eyes of Death to blow a hole through Tatari Arkway something she had never practiced before. While she was in one of the fights dodging Tatari Arkaway's attacks, she still managed to save Shiki and prevent him from being injured. In that same fight, Sion was able to use the information that she acquired from Shiki beforehand and turn it into yet another ether light manipulation. She was able to tie Tatari Arkaway down by using her own chains. Now, when you head over to her fight with Wallachia is when she gets real crazy. We see that Wallachia gets lured in by Shiki, but he actually turns out to be a shadow clone. 
She made the same clone out of Arkawade as well. You had Wallachia out here praising her for being able to combine her knowledge with her vampiric moves. Now remember how I said that Scion is always ahead. And not only did she survive Wallachia's spells, but unbeknownst to him, she actually siphoned information that allowed for her survival. Using this, she was able to form a shadow clone of Rice by Strideberg, a shield knight for the church who happens to specialize in defense and block his attacks. She then had the clone stun Wallachia by using one of the weapons from the church and effectively merged the clone's entire being into one of her bullets to finish the job. And in this last fight specifically, she did all of this dolo, no help involved. As I said before, Wallachia is a dead apostle ancestor and Arkawade is a true ancestor. This may not sound like a big deal up front, but these are two of the highest entities in the entire Nasuverse. I mean like grand level entities. There's not too many beings that get as high as this. So the fact that she's hanging with them and beating them as a human at that is absolutely ridiculous. Ridiculous, you hear me? It's absurd. This is not the type of smoke that y'all want. I promise you. And then you have Fake Grand Order where she was able to hack the summoning system itself and bring about her own servant, Captain Nemo. Not to mention her using her knowledge about the Black Barrel to help out a certain someone. So here's the recap. If you pay attention to the way that she fights throughout the Melty Blood story, she tries her best not to get involved. The reason being is that fighting would require her to get more nourishment and more nourishment means that she would have to feast on her own kind, something that she faithfully tried to avoid. So she was feeding on her own blood and basically fighting with a handicap. But towards the end of the series, the shackles are off and she's really showing her ass. As far as the main weaknesses go, it is easy to get into her head at times due to the insecurities that she has from being an apostle. But again, this all depends on who it's coming from. Since she is such a thinker, you're probably better off attacking her mental, if nothing else. The next thing, of course, is the sun. As a vampire, her power and her energy will weaken while she's in the sun. So if you have any intentions on going against her, I recommend that you take this up before the sun goes down. And lastly, I would have to say, it is her low quality magic circuits. Because she has these type of circuits, she often has to rely on other tools in order for her to exceed. So if you can manage to strip her of these tools, she's going to be pretty bummed out. She does have some street fighting technique, don't get me wrong, but most of the time, especially in a world of mages, this just simply isn't going to cut it. Listen, I gotta hit my girl with the A rank overall, man. Highly intelligent, very resourceful, and best of all, she's posted in the field with the blicky on her hip. All I'm saying is, Kirisugu ain't the only one with sharp shooter out here. Let me know what you guys think. Like the video if you enjoyed it. Shout out to all the patrons, and I will be back with more Tight Moon content. It is your boy Saya. I'm out.